Oh, great sir, you must come quickly. There has been a murder at the house. Someone has killed our master and lord. Oh, mercy, why, why? Fear not, madam. I am Inspector Bullybeef, and I am here to solve your mystery. <laughs> well, welcome to another episode of How to Be a Great GM. In this episode, we're looking at the setting of mystery. Now, you could argue that it's not necessarily a setting, but it's more of a plot device. You could make that argument, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but it's just more interesting to look at mysteries as a setting. And the reason why is that they're relatively easy to make if you know how to do them, and they're really easy to stuff up and end up with players really not knowing what's going on if you don't follow a few basic steps. So we're going to look at the mystery as a setting, and you can import this into almost any type of campaign that you're running, and it really will feel like something fresh, and hopefully it really will reward your players for some very creative and logical thinking. So how do we set up a good mystery? Well, let's start at the very beginning. We need somebody to want something and have difficulty getting it. You guessed it, standard story stuff. Only this time, what we're doing is we're adding in a few little uh, tweaks to that. The villain wants something badly. What does he want? Well, that's an interesting question. Let's take a murder mystery as a standard example, although this really could apply to any type of mystery, missing data files, a stolen gem, whatever the case might be. But a murder mystery will, example, will be a good example, pardon me, uh, for us in tonight's uh, uh, recording. Uh, yes, they're recorded at night, obviously. So if we look at a murder, the first question is, why was the person murdered? We look for the motivator, the uh, raison d'etre, the reason why the man or woman was murdered. And invariably, it answers the question, I, our villain wants something and is having difficulty getting it because the person whom has it, whatever it is that he wants, is still alive. By killing that person, he gets it. What is it that he is after? That's something for you to decide and could be campaign or uh, adventure specific. In this case, let's say that our villain really wants to have a very small dagger which will unlock the secrets of the Da Vinci Code because it was used by Leonardo to sharpen his pencils whilst he was busy drawing the cartoon for the Last Supper in Florence or Venice or Milan. So this small dagger has got some code on it and that's what our villain wants. What does he need to do to get it? That's the next question you ask. What needs to happen in order for him to get the dagger? Well, he needs to kill the owner of the dagger. And why? Well, why does he need to kill the owner of the dagger? Let us come up with a reason. <clears throat> he needs to kill the owner of the dagger because the owner keeps the dagger around his neck as a keepsake because the family is, let's say, related to the da Vinci's in some kind of way. Perhaps the dagger was given as a gift by Leonardo to his faithful gardener. And the gardener has gone on in modern times. The family has grown and grown and grown and they are now a very influential family. But this particular individual who has now been murdered is the last in the line and thus is the only one who has the dagger. So now we know why the person needs to be killed. The next question we need to ask is, how was the crime committed? How was the mystery committed? If it was stolen data files, how were they stolen? If it was stealing the crown jewels, how was it stolen? If it was a murder, how was the murder committed? In our case, we've got two questions to answer. How was the murder committed and how was the dagger then subsequently stolen? And from that, a whole bunch of questions spring out. So let's work on it. How was the man murdered? Well, we want him to be murdered in the house because we've decided that the house provides us with some great locations. He could have been murdered in his office. He could have been murdered in his limo on the way to the opera. It really doesn't matter where you set it. You've just got to decide on a particular setting. And the reason will become clear in a little bit. So 
let's say he was murdered in his house, in his dining room, at, no, let's not say the dining room, let's say he was murdered in the lounge. Now, the mystery that you want to play out, I generally find that players are not very good at long-term investigations. So if you run a standard length game and it runs for maybe three hours or so, I would try and wrap up the mystery in no more than two sessions, simply because there is so much information that the players are going to need to accumulate and work out. To run it over more sessions means that they're going to have just so much stuff going on, they're going to get sidetracked, they're going to forget crucial things. So mysteries should really be kept on a very tight, tight budget. I would say maybe four, maybe five hours maximum spread over two sessions. If you push it to three, the third session really should be a climatic showdown, but I digress. So we now have this man who was murdered in his lounge and what was happening at the time that he was murdered. Why would it have been a noticeable incident? Was the house empty? Do you want to make this a clue gathering uh, type of mystery? Or was he throwing a dinner party? In which case this has now become an interrogation type murder mystery where the guests are now all interrogated with the standard where were you, what were you doing, do you have a reason to murder this man? Let's go with the fact that he was throwing a dinner party, but that his guests were in the dining room and he only had four guests with him. The guests have nothing to do with the uh, villain whatsoever. The villain struck because... Why did the villain struck on the... Struck, struck. Why did the villain strike on this particular night? So that's the next question that we need to ask. We still haven't answered the question of exactly how it was he murdered. Uh, we're going to come to that in a little bit. But we've now decided that the villain murders him on the night that he's throwing a dinner party. Why on that particular night? There has to be a reason for the crime happening when it does. Whether the files are being stolen, whether the crystal is being destroyed, whatever the, the, the case might be, whether villages are disappearing into green mist, it has to happen on a specific day for a reason. Now, this is one of the key things about running a mystery. You are absolutely bound by logical time. Time is how players are going to solve the mystery. They need to be able to get a whole bunch of clues, and we're going to come to clues a little bit later, but they need to get a whole bunch of clues that have got timestamps on them. And the reason why they need timestamps on them is so that they can eliminate certain things that were happening at the same time. So in the case, well, you see how excited I am about mysteries. Mysteries are really cool. So let's work out why on this particular night, because that's going to be the start of our player's investigation. Well, hopefully. The reason why the murderer has to happen, or the murder has to happen this very evening, is because our villain has discovered that the man is leaving. He is departing at 7 a.m. the following morning to go on a tour of the Papua New Guinean islands for the next 15 months. And our villain needs the dagger before then. So if he doesn't strike now, he has to reassemble his entire plan to somehow get to Papua New Guinea and do it out there. A smart villain might have waited for that, but we're not dealing with smart villains because ultimately we want him to be caught. So he has to make mistakes. And that's another very important thing about a mystery. Mistakes must be made. And that's the very next question we need to ask. What mistake was made? So was the man murdered in front of a, a witness? If so, why wasn't the witness killed or silenced in some way? Uh, witnesses are messy because then they can solve the whole thing if the players find them quite quickly. Uh, unless you discredit the witness and then it just becomes a whole bunch of he said, she said, don't go there. So what went wrong? Well, perhaps what went wrong was the fact that this particular evening the man was murdered and he had decided to leave the dagger in his bedroom. That's interesting. Very interesting. And it gives you a whole bunch of potential things for the future. But let's not get there just yet. Let's say that something that went wrong was the fact that the person who committed the murder didn't get the dagger, but was interrupted. Someone was coming into the room and they had to leave quickly. They left quickly by smashing out their way through a window onto the porch. And from the po porch, they went out into the garden. From the garden, they ran up the driveway. They got into their vehicle and they left. The man is now dead. Somehow your players are involved. 
Perhaps they're the ones who are having dinner with this man. I wouldn't necessarily do that because then you've got initiative roles to see who can get out of the mansion fast enough to catch a glimpse of the murderer, blah, 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 blah. But that is now our mystery. Our villain wants this dagger, so he sends an assassin, or maybe he goes himself, up to you as to where the villain sits in the hierarchy of villainousness. Send somebody through, that person confronts our man in the lounge. He doesn't cry out. That's an interesting clue. Or is it? does he cry out? No, we don't want him to cry out because our assassin is not that stupid. He knows that there's a dinner party going on, so he's gonna do it quietly, okay? So quietly he kills this man, searches frantically for the dagger, hears a guest arriving and rushes out. He leaves through the front, uh, through the window, out onto the porch, into the garden, along the driveway, back to his waiting vehicle, and he disappears. So this is our scene. Our heroes now get involved and they start to go to work. The very first thing that they should be doing is, of course, looking at the body. Now, the golden rule that I have for any kind of mystery is you need to have at every one of those steps clues. So why does the villain want the dagger? We need at least three clues scattered around the house as to who the villain is and as to why he would want the dagger. We need a clue about the why was the man murdered for the dagger. We need at least three clues there. We then need three clues as to the person who killed the man. We then need three clues as to the fact that it went wrong. We then need three clues outside as to where the villain or the creature left or ran to. And then in general, we need a further three clues just in totality as to the perhaps other things that are red herrings. Don't put in more than three clues that have nothing to do with this main story. You can put in clues that hint towards future things. You can put in clues that hint towards something that has absolutely nothing to do with anything, which you could save for later on in the further part of this grand setting of mystery that comes into play to make you look like a good GM. But those three clues should have nothing to do with it. No more than three clues. Don't get greedy. Players can't handle more than three red herrings. They need to assemble a puzzle. If you're giving them three extra pieces, that's fine. If you're giving them 10 extra pieces, they won't even know where to start. We then need three clues as to the fact that the dagger is still in the house. So now we just answer those, we just work out what those three clues are. So let's begin at the very first one. The clue about who is the villain. Uh, well, the villain is trying to solve this Da Vinci Code thing and he reckons that the dagger could be of use. So perhaps the villain decided that firstly, instead of killing the man, he would write a letter to him and say, My dear friend, I am very interested in learning about a dagger which I believe your family is in possession of. I would love to be able to examine this dagger. Now, that might be a great clue and it could be on a desk in the lounge uh, conspicuous perhaps because it is a letter who sends letters in this modern day and age we then need another two clues as to this person's identity we could have them sending a second letter i am very frustrated by your answer that you will not relinquish the dagger of your family to me for a simple observation I will be flying from Venice this evening to come and visit with you. Yours sincerely, B. Who is this B fellow? And we now know that he's coming from Venice, which is a link to Leonardo da Vinci in a small way. We could then have a newspaper article lying around on the desk that talks about a gentleman by the name of um, Baracuse a famous art collector of Leonardo da Vinci works, has been buying up da Vinci artworks across the globe uh, and all forgeries thereof in an attempt to solve the greatest mystery of our time, the Last Supper, or something along those lines. You could be a lot more creative than, than I can. So there are our three clues. Baracuse is this individual who's desperate to find this dagger. 
Now, those are actually a combination of clues because now the players are going, what's this dagger? And if they're not smart enough to pick up on the fact that this man was murdered for the dagger, well, that's okay. We've got plenty more clues to go for. And the next one will then be at the body. How is the man murdered? Well, if the murder itself is not some kind of ritualistic device or sacrifice or gang murder, in other words, if the murder is not part of the plot, Baracuse does not care how the man dies. He just wants the necklace and the dagger that hangs upon it. His assassin can use any means to get it. So how would the assassin try and get this thing from around this man's neck? We can imagine the scene that there is a noise that causes our victim to get up from the dining room table and go into the lounge. There he finds the assassin frantically going through his desk drawers, perhaps looking for the dagger that the man would maybe have left behind. The man confronts him. What are you doing in my house? Who are you? The assassin turns, sees that the man may have it around his neck, and so rushes forward and rips the man's shirt open because he wants to get to the neck line. He realizes that there's nothing in the neck. A struggle ensues as our victim tries to fight off his attacker and the attacker in his desperate attempt to get away and now to evacuate the scene because there's a scuffle going on and there is some kind of noise happening, grabs a nearby lampshade and smashes our victim over the head, destroying his face and leaving him in a pool of blood. We then hear guests coming in from outside, uh, from the dining room, and so in his desperate attempt to escape, he tries to run through what he thinks is an open door, only to realize that it is a plate glass window where he then cuts himself. Now let's unwind that scene quickly. We have a lampshade as a murder weapon. Now what this could imply to certain players is that this was not a murder, as at first one might think. This was a crime that happened by accident. There was no intention here to kill this man. He just died as a result of a, an issue. So our three clues, the ripped open shirt. Why would you rip open a man's shirt? If you make it very obvious that the shirt was ripped before the, the scuffle happened, perhaps a good detective will work this out by the fact that the buttons are scattered in one particular location and then the rest of the room is dislocated. His shirt was ripped open. Someone was looking for something, but why rip his shirt open? Was it a woman who tried to rip his shirt open? No, because we have to eliminate the female because it could have been a fight between a man and a woman. She rips his shirt open for a moment of passion. He says no, she hits him with a lampshade and runs through the plate glass window. We have to establish that it was definitely a male murderer and that this wasn't a gay love trust because how would we do this? Well, we can put footprints on the carpet. It's a good old fashioned standard technique. You can think of a lot more creative ways of doing this. I'm just giving you my process. So we've got great big footsteps on the carpet. How did he get into the room in the first place? Well, he couldn't have come in through the plate glass window because he didn't know that it was open. He thought it was, he just didn't check before he ran through it. So maybe he came in through a window. So what that would imply is that that eliminates the fact that this was a romantic truss. The window is fairly high up, so whoever came in needed to come in quite carefully. Or even better yet, perhaps they came in through a skylight down a rope. That's certainly not very romantic, and if that's what you need to do to get romance, I think you need to see the police. So this figure came in on a rope down through the skylight. They left muddy footprints all over the place because they trekked along the driveway. We know they trekked along the driveway going out. We might as well have them doing the same coming in. So we have a rope hanging from a skylight, which should eliminate any kind of, oh, this was a minor emotional scuffle. This was someone with intent. This was an experienced burglar who came in via the skylight, which says planning. It says understanding of how to get into this venue without tripping off any alarms. The giant soldier-like mud boots should give our players some indication that this was a very strong man and that he was wearing maybe military-grade boots. That might send them off on some weird and wonderful tangents hunting down the military, but there should be enough of a link that they can maybe draw a parallel to this Baracuse fellow. 
by the way, we don't want them to suspect Barracuse straight away. So maybe in the photograph in the newspaper, Barracuse is sitting in a wheelchair. Now remember, this is you can all add as you're going along before you launch the adventure. So if Barracuse is sitting in a wheelchair and he's this crippled man, he can't be the one who's wearing size 11 work boots that uh, have trampled mud all over the carpet. He also couldn't have launched himself out of a plate glass window. That takes quite a lot of effort. Coming back to the body itself, though, we need one more clue as to indicate something. And here we're driving home the clue of the dagger. What the players will discover is that around his neck, there is a definite greening of a copper necklace or perhaps a greening of a silver necklace that has been worn for many, many, many years. And perhaps the slightest impression of a dagger on his sternum where it has rested since he was a young child. But it is not there. That is the important thing. And it cannot be found anywhere in the room. So this now gives us three clues for the murderer. This gives us three clues for the murder scene itself. And we're starting to build up a very strong case about this dagger. We don't yet have the final clincher. So the players will now go and investigate the, the friends who were attending dinner. Here is another opportunity for you to give out a whole bunch of information and to throw out your first red herring. The first red herring should be one of the dinner guests saying, well, I bet you it was that Martha woman. She's been after him ever since he sold her house. Yo, no, he owned an estate and uh, she was renting it from a poor girl, Martha. Of course, she was a bit of a, a drinker, you know. So, yeah, no, she was renting it for years. And then he bought it out from the, from the other owner and he actually closed it down you know, and he kicked her out. Oh, she would have been after him like you can't believe. The players will jump onto this immediately and assume that Martha perhaps has been involved somehow. It's fine, let them do that. We'll discover later on that Martha is using ancient rites to bring him back from the dead because she wants to have her revenge on him and she refuses to let him die before she has done so. But that's another mystery. Who stole the body from the morgue? Anyway, let's not go there. So that's one piece of information. Another piece of information could be from one of the guests who says, well, of course, you know, the family are very old. And um, originally from Venice, I think, or Florence, somewhere around there, a bunch of bloody Italians, you know, but you can't trust these Italians, really. You know, they, they, they're a funny bunch of people, very emotional Italians. They speak with their hands a lot. Uh, I, I think his study, there's a portrait that Leonardo did of his grandfather, a bloody gardener. Can you believe it? <laughs> well, anyway. Again, that should reinforce the Leonardo da Vinci connection. So the players might go off and then look in his study. Perfect. In his study, this is where we find a note saying, Since you have refused to give me access to your necklace, I am forced to continue my research without it. I hope you can live in good conscience knowing you have thwarted a very important artistic endeavor. Um, I trust no harm will come to you in the future, B. Again, reinforcing, you can make it a bit more threatening. It doesn't have to be a letter. It could simply be an email that's on his laptop. That might be a little bit better actually because then the guys who've got hacking can start to make roles and things. When you're designing, and this is a total aside, and I know I'm rambling a little bit, but as, a, as an aside, the, the clues that you're working out for your players, you should always try and work out clues that use the most amount of skills amongst your player base. So if you've got a hacker, this is obviously a modern setting. If you've got a hacker, if you've got a, a detective type, if you've got someone who's into history, you should try and use all of those different skills to make each one feel as if they're contributing towards the ultimate solution of this mystery. Of course, it doesn't feel like a mystery to us because we know what happened. The players, of course, won't. So they now go to the study, they discover a threatening email perhaps that's been sent. Maybe also they discover the ancient textbook that this man has pulled out because of all these letters from this mysterious character named B or Barracuse, um, that he has been researching what the dagger could possibly mean. If this is not enough to convince the players that the dagger is the critical reason for the murder and that the murder was merely an accident, then you need better players because it is very obvious by now that the dagger is the key. But where is the dagger? Did the man get it? They don't know that yet, and it's now up to you to decide 
did he or did he not get it? It creates more tension if he didn't get it. Because now we go back to that original story. Our villain wants something badly and is having difficulty getting it. He wanted that dagger. He had difficulty getting it because his villain screwed up when he tried to attack the house and the man in the house. And now the players have the dagger. They don't necessarily know what it's being used for. So that gives you a whole bunch of adventures moving forward. But where is the dagger? Where can we put the dagger that we've hinted at? Well, it should be hidden behind the painting of the father or the great grandfather who was the gardener, shouldn't it? Because we've thrown out some clues there. So you could work out all sorts of ideas. And perhaps if you really want to build in some tenuous links, the painting in the background has a house and the house looked exactly like the house that Martha was thrown out of. And that's why he had it destroyed or, or whatever the case might be. So now they go to the study, they find this chain. Others in the party may have gone outside. They might have got to the window. Now the window, it is very important to have your players make some kind of deductive reasoning check or skill or role or whatever the case might be. The glass is outwards. There is no glass inside. And you can emphasize this point to make sure that they actually start to investigate it. The glass has been bashed outwards. That means someone ran out of this room. We know it wasn't the victim because he was dead at the time. Do you see how important timing becomes? So, and he's got no lacerations on him to indicate that he went through any kind of glass. So it must be the person who killed him that went through the glass pane. To do that requires some strength. And this is where you can ratchet up a little bit of terror and say this would require some considerable force to go through. A normal person would have been cut to shreds, but you can't find any blood on the glass. Well, that's if you're running a supernatural kind of uh, uh, modern day campaign. Otherwise, if it was a real human, you find blood all over the place. If they have access to a laboratory, well, they'll send the blood off to go and have it sampled. Of course, that gives us an opportunity to have it destroyed en route or for them to actually discover who it was. Because remember, they do need to capture this goon, this villain, uh, not nemesis. That is our ultimate goal, because we need some kind of resolution, some kind of closure, and some kind of hinting that Barracuse is in actual fact the mastermind behind this whole process. So there is glass outside. We see the footprints on the porch. Then we see a jump. Again, this is up to you. If it's supernatural, the jump is, say, 80 foot down into the garden below. Or the jump is three foot down over a balustrade into a nice privet. Nonetheless, the character moves from the privet, but ah, remember, something has to go wrong. We need to give our characters clues. What goes wrong? Well, there is always the opportunity of having that little box of matches that was given out at some cheesy motel and that happened to fall out of his pocket. You could go one further if your group is more technologically based. His cell phone fell out of his pocket. Is he going to come back for it? Is he not going to come back? No, he's running. He knows that there's all sorts of trouble coming his way. Maybe he's going to come back for it later on this evening. Who knows? It depends on what your players do as to what he's going to do. Because remember, they do need to catch him. So you need to leave some kind of clue in the garden for them to find. And don't make it one of those, oh, well, it's a coin that can only be found in a certain part of Nebraska. And it's a celebratory coin for war veterans. It's a good link, but that coin needs to have landed in such a way that the laser beam that detects movement in the garden is shining off of it. So it's not a ridiculously high discovery check. And this is the other thing to bear in mind. Yes, it's fun to make the players sweat a little bit and to make the difficulty of the setting very hard. The players are already suffering from brain problems. A mystery is not an easy thing to solve. There's so many clues going on. There's so much information coming through. The players really don't need the burden of ridiculously difficult checks. For additional stuff, over and above the basic clues that you're going to be giving them, taking a DNA sample from under the man's nails, looking for a hair that's dropped in the carpet, that kind of stuff, you can do that because that's way too investigatory for what this kind of mystery is. And of course, you can take it to that level, but bear in mind, the players must be able to solve this. So we've got a clue in the garden. They then go outside to look on the street, 
road and of course there are surveillance cameras so they can pull the data and they can see this big man running into this truck and driving off and they can get his license plate so they can run it with the police to start tracking him down. So the mystery of the house now starts to solve itself. They now start to see exactly how it fits together. In their minds, they can build a very clear pattern of A to B to C to D. They now have a link to follow this man to wherever he's going. They can now decide because by now it changes. It's no longer a mystery. Now it is a chase they try, or a, a seeker kind of game. Uh, mystery is only when they're trying to solve what happened and why. They don't necessarily know why it happened, although they've got some pretty good clues. Someone was after this dagger which hung around this man's neck for a very long time. That means the family put lots of importance on it. So the book, uh, the, the, the library geeks can run off to go and research this dagger and this necklace. The technophiles can go off and do all of the laboratory stuff. And the big goons can go and try and find this motel or this whatever clue you've given them in the garden, as well as try and track down the license plate. That would then bring them together later on where they can compare notes. Now, the reason why time is so important is we know how it works from the villain's perspective, but let's look at it from the player's perspective. They arrive and they're told that there is this murder that's happened. Someone has killed the owner of the house. They see signs of a struggle. They see signs of someone using the lampshade to kill this man. That's all they see. Over time, they start to, dis to, to find these clues that there's a man who's been writing letters to this gentleman asking about a certain dagger. They then see that the man was killed in such a way that it doesn't look like it was intended. It looks more like an accident. They see a broken window pane. They see a painting of a man standing in a garden by Leonardo da Vinci. They have some guests talking about various other bits and pieces. And that is what they see. You need to get them to see your side of the story. And that means giving them lots of clues. Now, we gave them one red herring with Martha, which we may or may not tie in loosely for another adventure. We can throw out two more red herrings. Perhaps the matches don't lead anywhere, or perhaps the matches lead to a den of thieves who will just attack the players on sight. Uh, perhaps the cell phone has been wiped, or perhaps the cell phone belongs to the man who was in, the, who, who, to the victim. So it doesn't necessarily lead to the, uh, the goon who killed him. We do need to have enough clues for them to find that goon, but we need one more red herring as well. So maybe the maid is very weird. She's very cagey. And she has a grudge against her master because she was going to get fired because she had been, she had been found to be stealing things. Now, that's a red herring, but it could also give us an opportunity to take the adventure in a slightly different path if the players don't get the clues that we've been giving them. What was she trying to steal? Well, she confesses that she was contacted by a man, she doesn't know his name, who wanted the dagger. Ah, oh, well, that's interesting. So she tried to steal it and she got caught, but she was going to be fired after the dinner party. She was going to take the dagger and she was going to leave it in a post box. That's all she knows. That might be a little bit of a dead end for the players, but it's a red herring because it has nothing to do with the main story. It's not going to get them to tracking down the goon. It's going to send them off on a wild goose chase to a post box and they're going to sit there for hours and you're going to say to them, you don't see anybody arriving because the villain Barracuse is not going to not watch that post box. He's going to watch it very, very closely. And when he sees the players putting the dagger there, unless they get the maid to do it, if they do the maid to do it, then they're particularly clever, bring out the villain and his goon, let them catch the goon. And of course, Barracuse gets away. And of course, he's not a paraplegic in the slightest. He's actually an Olympic gymnast or whatever the case might be. That's another another thing. So I hope this helps you to understand that constructing a mystery is fairly easy if you look at it from a sequential point of view and at every point in the mystery, and you know how it unfolds because of course it's your mystery, and at every point you're laying down three clues, just pushing more and more information. It might seem like it's too much to you. You might go, oh, but that makes it so easy. You don't know your players very well. Some of them might jump to the conclusions, but will the rest of them? They'll probably argue and debate and do all sorts of other things, which is all part of the game. Let them have fun with it. Until next time, happy gaming.